Okay, thank you. Um, as you've just heard, uh, I'm not an expert at all in this field. Uh, I'm a traditional World Bank economist, but Bijou wanted me to read this um, paper and, and say a few, few things. So I wrote down a few notes, uh, nothing really deep, but um, um, I just heard that I have 15 minutes, so I don't know, if I have about five or six slides, mostly notes, so I think I can go through them very quickly. So what I would like to do is to maybe say a few words about why I like very much this paper, and then um, um, kind of uh, 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 reflect on some of the assumptions behind um, uh, JP's uh, analysis and, and maybe ask a few questions um, to open up. Uh, well, it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting paper. Um, I think Arshan just explained some of the reasons why. Um, clearly, there is a lack of uh, comparative analysis of uh, global governance institution. Um, I'm, I'm, I haven't been following closely political science uh, literature or international relations literature, but for, from what I, I know, um, clearly this, this kind of analysis is very much needed. Um, one thing I very much like uh, in the first section of the paper is a critical review of the literature. Uh, I, I think he did a masterful job uh, bringing together almost everything that everyone needs to know about what's going on in all kinds of fields, uh, not only political science, but also international relations, uh, comparative sociology, and many other things. So, uh, and, and he highlights, obviously, uh, the gaps in knowledge, and, and he explained why he wanted to do this. And uh, he uses uh, the WTO and, and UNESCO uh, to, 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 to come up with, um, as Arshon said, a very provocative uh, conclusion that uh, the WTO, despite its uh, poor media reputation, might actually be a quote-unquote better place uh, for global governance than UNESCO. Uh, so I won't discuss these things because I think that Arshan uh, uh, very eloquently went into, into those things. So let me just uh, 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 discuss some of his assumptions, but uh, First, presenting quickly his uh, methodology. He uses what he calls issue structures, which he very simply defined as um, organizational goals uh, on any given issue, uh, the involvement of uh, relevant actors and, and their interests, the media and press coverage, things like that. So he, go through, he goes through that and uh, he looks at uh, how these two institutions uh, perform on those and he come up with, with uh, his conclusion. Now. Well, uh, he makes some explicit assumptions, and um, here I want to go through a few of them and, and maybe ask just a couple of questions. Uh, he believes that governan global governance uh, is a good thing, whatever it means. Um, uh, now, as, as an economist, I'm still not sure I, I have a clear understanding of what global governance is or should be. But in any case, he believes that it, it's a good thing. And he also believes that deliberation is uh, the suitable principle and really the optimal framework for global governance. Uh, and, uh, from what I've heard uh, in this room since this morning, uh, almost everybody seems to believe that. Um, um, but but um, I, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, first, because uh, um, I'm not sure we have a very rigorous definition of what deliberations should be about. Uh, we have a sense, we have some principles and so on. But um, uh, as somebody who likes numbers, I'm always looking for the empirics. Uh, uh, if, if we had to measure deliberation, how would we go about it? Uh, how would we, what would make us feel really confident that we have a rigorous empirical basis uh, to, to assert that it's all the time for any issue uh, of quote unquote global governance the right format and the right framework. I'm not sure. Um, so inclusion, transparency, and, tr uh, and trust are needed. Uh, he asserted that in the paper uh, within the international organization. Uh, my question is obviously is whether it's realistic. Um, I, we work here in this place, which I consider personally to be 
one of the best organizations in the world, but uh, I'm sure we all complain 20 times a day about what's going on in this place. Uh, and if we had to discuss even here at the bank what inclusion, transparency, and trust means and how they should be defined and measured, uh, I'm not sure we would um, agree on, on much of uh, anything. Uh, another assumption which uh, JP makes implicitly in the paper is to say that decisions should not be driven by experts. He makes that point three or four times. And as somebody who's some, sometimes accused of being an expert, obviously I had to jump on that and, 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 and wonder um, whether uh, we really want non-expert to make decisions. Uh, reading the paper, I step back and try to think of any single issue for which I would want non-expert to be involved and make decisions, and I couldn't find any. Certainly not uh, trade issues at the WTO, certainly not education issues, certainly not health issues, certainly not transportation issues. So I, I wonder why this disdain for experts. Um, uh, in fact, um, uh, thinking of uh, somebody who is in the news these days, uh, George W. Bush, whom I, uh, I disagree with almost everything he did when he was a president, but he said something which really fascinated me once, talking about a completely different issue, um, uh, talking about um, uh, racism in education in, in America. And he said uh, this wonderful sentence, I'm sure he didn't write it, but somebody wrote it for him, uh, uh, the soft bigotry of low expectations, uh, which some people in this country, according to him, have for blacks. And I found that phrase very powerful and, and lovely, lovely thought about. Uh, now, what does it have to do with uh, JP's paper? No, I was just thinking about this, his paper, uh, in terms of his uh, skepticism with experts and his strong belief in bottom up solutions. And I was wondering if, if uh, I could be provocative by saying that he's advocating maybe the soft bigotry of high expectations to people who are not expert and who, believe, who, who are involved, <laughs> who have the right to be involved in any issue simply because they are people. In any case, uh, let's go quickly to the implicit assumptions in, in the paper. Uh, going back to his definition of uh, issue structure, which is really uh, the device that he uses in, in this paper. Uh, well, he believes that organizational goals on an issue are always stated. Um, uh, at the, he, and he goes back and, and he reads uh, WTO and uh, uh, UNESCO's um, uh, statutes and so on. Well, I'm not sure the true goals are really there. Um, these are, you know, official documents, but um, every day, sometime I, I go back and I read the article of agreements of the World Bank to see if what uh, we are doing, uh, what we discuss in meetings, are really things which are uh, in, in the article of agreements. I'm not sure. So maybe some of these things should not be taken at face value. Um, he also believes that the involvement of relevant actors and their interest uh, is, is a, a very key criteria. Well, uh, how do we identify relevant actors? Um, how do we really know what their interests are? Um, um, he, he obviously, like uh, everybody who believes in, in the democratic ideal, at least uh, stated uh, the Western way, uh, he believes very much in the importance of media. Um, I myself am a big fan of media, but um, um, I, I because I'm a big fan of media, I don't always trust media. I've been reading the New York Times every single day for the past 15 years since I came to this country. Um, and I can tell you that I don't believe 90% of what they write, especially on issues that I know something about. Um, uh, and I can just give you one, one fact about the New York Times, which I still consider maybe not the best newspaper in the world, but maybe the least worst. Uh, um, um, I haven't seen on the front page of the New York Times for the past 15 years, and I read this paper every single day, a single good positive story about Africa. Not once in 15 years. I, I can believe that there's nobody at the New York Times who asks himself or herself that question. So uh, I'm from Africa, and I know that it's a continent where there are 
clearly terrible things going on, but a lot of wonderful things. But you would never, never know that by reading the least worst or the best new, <laughs> newspaper in the world. So um, I, I, I believe in media and press coverage as uh, indicators of, of democratic ideals, but uh, we should uh, be careful what, what we really talk about here. And, uh, another thing is the legitimacy of the representatives. Who goes to the WTO? What are these, who are these people? Who are these governments who are there? Um, a lot of these governments represent authoritarian regimes, people who have not been elected, who are not accountable to anybody, who speak at the WTO or the UNESCO on behalf of the people. Why should we even listen? Why should we take them seriously? What can we do about it? So how do we use that to measure anything? Um, except maybe power. Um, well, I think I have a, a minute left, so let me just um, uh, say that um, there's a lot of challenges of deliberations at the international level. One is obviously the credibility, the very credibility of these forums. Um, well, uh, who decides on membership there? Um, on UNESCO, uh, when I was assigned to read this paper, I went back to read a little bit of um, uh, the history of UNESCO and uh, the history of the relationship the, with the United States, for instance. There, there would be a lot to talk about there. The, the US was out of UNESCO for 18 years because they didn't like what was going out there. Were they wrong? Were they right? Um, uh, who decide? Um, what's the credibility? Uh, another very important organization these days is the International C uh, Criminal Court, ICC. Well, the U.S. is not there. Uh, in fact, they signed the Rome uh, Statute in 1980, uh, in 2000, and then they withdrew from, from it. Uh, China is not there. India is not there. So why would the authoritarian leader of Sudan uh, take the ICC seriously? Uh, uh, I mean, w my point is that all these organizations have a lot of credibility issues. Uh, fundamentally, that we need to discuss. And uh, Arjun Apardurai said this morning that context is boundless because when there's a context, there's another broader context, and then it keeps going on and on. We can say the same thing about global governance, whatever we define it. Um, uh, I think JP mentioned the G G G G20 today. Well, they are currently in Seoul making decisions uh, that affect uh, the G160 or whatever number it is, the countries w which are not there, who gives them the right? Why would we in Nigeria, a country, I'm not Nigerian, but why would uh, Nigeria, a country with 150 million people, uh, feel bounded by whatever some people have unilaterally decided in Seoul? So there are a lot of questions. Voice and participation, uh, how do you measure that? Is it just uh, the percentage of your voting power on the board? Uh, or the number of people that you have uh, in senior management? I'm, I'm not sure. So there are a lot of issues there, but uh, I'll, I'll stop here so that we can have time for, for conversation.